many uh, Dallas natives do I have? Okay, okay. And what about what about my Dallas transplants? Oh, all right. So pretty even there. All right. Well, our next speaker is doing something. I'm a Dallas native, by the way, that I appreciate and I hope all of you appreciate. But he's trying to make our city better. So can we welcome Robert Kent? <laughs> Good evening, my name is Robert Kent, and tonight I want to talk about building a better Dallas, one neighborhood at a time. I want to start by showing you some pictures. This here is Elm Street circa, well it will be Elm Street circa 1905. Um, and I just love this picture. We have um, an amazing street scene with um, life and activity happening all over it. We have, uh, zoom in and you can see amazing details like little boys who are riding the back of these carriages and people standing on the side. There's even an old bar in one of the one of the side streets there. This here is a junction of the railway between the Texas and Pacific Line and the Houston Central Railway, which now sits where I-345 is, the highway that separates downtown Dallas and Deep Ellum. Um, and this picture here is also from Elm Street in 1945, outside the Majestic Theater, when John Wayne movie Red River was released. This is a scene that you would never actually see today outside of the turkey trot. But somewhere along the way in the mid 20th century, we embarked, like the rest of the city and the rest of the country, on a new expansion program based around building our city for the automobile. This meant making our streets wider, turning many of them one way, and at its pinnacle, an expansion of our highway network, which was an unprecedented public works program. And our highway stopped at nothing. This is I-35 and I-30 as they're sawing their way across Dallas through the middle and the hearts of neighborhoods. So by 1999, we actually were number three in the country for highway lanes per mile, um, or vehicle miles, um, highway lanes per capita in the city, only behind Fort Worth and Kansas City. At the same time, the friendliness of our city for pedestrians plummeted. Uh, this is a ranking of walkability from walk score, and you can see we don't even make the first half of the list. We have to be on the second side of the screen here, um, that far down. It's not all doom and gloom, though. Um, if we look outside right now on Jefferson Street, for instance, that's a great example of walkable uh, development that's still here in our community. And also Lower Greenville does a really good job with wide sidewalks and narrow streets, and it's very friendly for pedestrians. But more often than not, our city ends up looking like this, the intersection of Greenville and Forest, where I grew up. And it's characterized by a blacktop asphalt pavement next to a six-lane um, road and a little pity sidewalk that's barely wide enough for two people to walk abreast of each other. So what? I mean, sure, it's, it's not pretty, and um, perhaps it doesn't fit our, my millennial ideal of what good city living is. Um, but what does all this have to do with building a good city or building good neighborhoods? I, I want to show you a map that I've been kind of obsessed with for the past several months. Uh, this is a map of Dallas, and each dot represents a person, and it's color-coded by race. Segregation has been illegal for decades, but you wouldn't know it by looking at this map. At the same time, poverty is eating at the core of our city. Even though the region has been booming for the last uh, many decades, from 2000 to 2010, our population grew by less than 1%. At the same time, poverty grew by over 40%, and today, the rate of child poverty in our city is 39%. I think there's a quote here from Chuck Marone that really explains this well. You know, tragically, the layout and design of America could not be more perfectly designed to amplify our fears and insecurities. The greatest tragedy of urban design in our city is that the dividing line between the haves and the have-nots is whether you have a car or whether you don't. It took me 15 minutes to get here today by car would have taken me three times as long by bus. So what can we do about this? How can we make this better? And I have two propositions I want to submit to you tonight. The first is that I think we need to return to a more traditional way of city building, which looks something like this, a postcard from Main Street, Dallas, over 100 years ago. And it's characterized by medium density, incremental development that's walkable. And it's designed in a way that the ticket price for admission to a high quality of life is not the purchase cost of an automobile. But secondly, I think we all bear a personal responsibility for making our city and our neighborhoods better. And at its most basic level, this means knowing who your neighbors are. 
This is an exercise by um, a guy named uh, Dave Runyon, who I really admire. And it represents you and your eight closest neighbors, the people who literally share a wall with you or share a property line with you. And so you're in the middle and you fill out the names of every person that's around there. Who here could do that today? I'd argue that if we're going to make a great city, we need great neighborhoods. And great neighborhoods start with being good neighbors. And knowing your neighbors is the first step. Thank you.